So the beer's criteria. Expanded to use in outpatient care. We use that in outpatient care now. We use it in inpatient care in hospitals. We use it in clinics and nursing homes. We're starting to use it in electronic health records where you have a medical health record that's online and maybe it'll put a stop that says to the doctor, hey, you know what? Do you want to prescribe this medication? Because this person's a little older and we want to consider things before we do them. It's often used as a compliance measure in HEDIS or CMS. So if you don't know what that is, you don't, not ne- you don't necessarily have to. But basically, there are organizations that regulate how things work in clinics and in nursing homes. And they'll use it as a measure to say, are we really treating people the way we should? Now, that's not how these criteria were really meant to be intended, but that's how they're being used, and they can be helpful in patient care. Insurance companies, and if you're a nurse, you may have run into this. Insurance companies are using this as a point of care. You know, are, are you prescribing inappropriate things? Well, we don't necessarily want to pay for this. However, you may have run into this. I know I've run into this a lot. A lot of the times they don't pay for the alternatives. They'll say, hey, we're not going to pay for this because it's inappropriate possibly. And you say, okay, well, the alternative is this. Well, they don't cover that. So I think we're all trying to work with this new criteria in order that that doesn't happen, but you will run into that, and that's just something in the real world that we're going to have to work with. Now, 2012 is the fourth version of the Beers Criteria, written by Dr. Mark Beers originally. Now, he died a few years ago, so he wasn't involved in this new incarnation, but they certainly used the spirit of which he had, which was a passion for geriatric medicine and protecting older adults. It's more scientifically rigorous overall. And before you get all sleepy, I'm not going to go into great detail about the scientific rigorousness of it, except to say that they used a modified Delphi criteria, which means basically they had a bunch of people who were experts, and people who are experts tend to have very, very strict opinions, and you don't want those people coming to blows, and you want to have a systematic way to look at things. So basically what that is is you have a bunch of surveys at the end, a bunch of surveys At the beginning, a bunch of surveys in the middle, people put in their input, and then they come to a consensus criteria. This version has evidence rankings and recommendation rankings, which the previous versions did not have. And I think these are good, but they may be a little scary for people if you don't know how to interpret them. Basically, the evidence rankings means that in, in this set of the 2002, what, what they did was is really look at the evidence. They looked at randomized controlled trials way back and then now. And then their recommendations are ranked as strong or moderate or weak recommendations. The evidence is ranked as strong or moderate or weak. And then sometimes, because science isn't always real life and time gets in the way, some of the trials were old or maybe the science doesn't apply, but we all know it's bad, you'll get a little bit of a discrepancy. So you might have the evidence is weak, but the recommendation is strong. So if you're reading through these or I'm explaining things, that's why. And I'm going to give you an example of that. Desiccated thyroid or armor thyroid might be one you're familiar with is basically where they took the thyroid from an animal and dried it out and extracted things from it and made it a pill and gave it to people who had low thyroid. So that's what desiccated thyroid is. We have better drugs or newer drugs, such as levothyroxine, the brand name of which is Synthroid. Now, the beer's recommendation is to avoid it because other preparations are safer and they're more effective. The quality of evidence, though, is low. It's not high evidence because it's old. There's old drugs. Trials aren't as rigorous or they weren't done or there weren't as many of them as we needed for the comparable recommendations. But the recommendation to avoid it is strong. So that sort of seems like 2 plus 2 equals 5 to me. And why is that? It's because the sum of all this information they took is is greater than the individual parts. It's a consensus criteria. So potentially inappropriate medications, PIMS, there's three groups. One group is medications to avoid regardless of disease or condition. Now, again, I want to stress this isn't to replace clinical judgment, but they're recommending, if we can, try to avoid these. The second is medications that are potentially inappropriate when used if someone has a particular disease or a syndrome, such as heart failure. The third, and this is new to this 2012 edition, are medications that are to be used with caution. 
They might be newer medications where evidence is still emerging. There could have been different opinions on the consensus. They could have not known exactly where to put it. And that's where these ended up. So you want to look at these with caution. And basically, I think of this as you look both ways before you cross the street, and then you look back again. So we're going to think about what could happen if we do, what could happen if we don't give it. And then once we give it, if we give it, we're going to look back again and see what happened. Now. Some medications were removed since 2003, and don't start to get worried. I'm not going to go through a huge list of this was removed and this wasn't, and there were 19 drugs and 17 drugs. I've attended enough of those presentations that made me fall asleep to not want to do that to you. But I'm going to mention a little bit of how it works. So some had come off the market. So you, like Darvacet, we know that's come off the market. So obviously we don't need to have that on the Beers criteria any longer. Some didn't have enough evidence maybe because they were older, maybe because they were newer, some because it was conflicting, and some just had issues that were true and were real, but they weren't exclusive to the elderly. So rather than having the hugest list possible, they took it down to just things that are pretty much exclusive to the elderly. Which It doesn't mean that it doesn't apply to other people. For example, fluoxetine, and again, this is one of those antidepressants, those SSRIs, also known as Prozac, used to be on there as a potentially inappropriate medication in the elderly pretty much by itself. They took it off this time because there was insufficient data to support what we had thought previously. Now, it's still included in the Beers criteria, but they moved it to just serotonin reuptake inhibitors. And because sometimes those drugs cause SIADH, which is syndrome of inappropriate diuretic hormone, and all that means is that your water and fluid and electrolyte balance gets off and sometimes maybe your sodium will get very, very low and you'll have symptoms of dementia or other symptoms that can come up with this. All of the SSRIs, those kind of specific antidepressants, and sometimes maybe even the SNRIs, the ones that uptake serotonin and norepinephrine, can cause this. So you want to think and you want to evaluate. So we moved things around a little bit. And when I say we, I wasn't involved in developing this at all. It's just I'm so involved with reading it all the time that I feel like it's we. And we as a group as pharmacists and caregivers and nurses. Ferrous sulfate greater than 325 milligrams a day was taken off. And long-term use of stimulant laxatives like bisacodyl was removed except in cases when taking opiate analgesics. And just so you know, if you're not familiar with how this works, if you are taking Vicodin or you're taking Oxycontin or you're taking morphine and you're taking it for a long time, it can give you that dry mouth feeling. But what it also does is it messes up the way your colon pushes things through till the point of excretion and having a bowel movement. It makes things sort of move like this in your colon and things don't get out. So if you're on a bunch of stimulant laxatives, we want you, or a, a bunch of opiate analgesics, we want you to take a stimulant laxative so that we can push things through. You don't get impacted, you don't get constipated, those kind of things. Now, some meds were added since 2003. Some were added independent of why you would use them, and some were added relating only to a specific diagnosis or syndrome. So gliburide, that's a medication that reduces blood sugar, and it's a good medication. But in the elderly, it can cause an increased risk of hypoglycemia or prolonged hypoglycemia. And of course, we know that can cause falls, that can cause you to go into a coma. A lot of bad things can happen from this. There are other alternatives that we could use. And just so you know, the Beers criteria doesn't necessarily recommend alternatives, but you can find other resources for that. And if you want to email in, I'm happy to give you resources. Sleep aids such as Zolpidem, which is Ambien, or Lunesta, or Sonata, used for greater than 90 days were added. Magase was on, but added a little more clearly. Caffeine was added. Caffeine is a drug in insomnia. Now, that seems to make sense, but it's something to consider that we don't always consider when we're looking. H1 blockers and H2 blockers, what are those? What are you talking about? Those are antihistamines, some you're familiar with. H1 blockers, diphenhydramine, that's Benadryl. Loratadine, which is Claritin, those are on there. They're regular antihistamines, things you know about. What you might not know is that Zantac or Pepsid, those things that you take to reduce acid in your stomach, those are actually types of antihistamines, and they're H2 blockers. So when someone has delirium, you want to think about, well, you know what, did we just give them an H1 blocker or an H2 blocker, or have they been on one for a while? 
are these things causing the delirium, but the, then also backwards? If they have delirium, do we want to give them these drugs? You have to think about things like that. Antipsychotics added, they were added to use with caution. They're on the use with caution list. And if you don't know, antipsychotics are a huge point of contention in long-term care with elderly people. And we'll go through that in more detail in just a little bit here. I'm going to go through a detailed discussion of every medication on this list. No, I'm not. <gasps> Why would I do that to you? You would fall asleep. They have a list. You can look at it. You can ask us questions specific to the list. If, if I don't go through something that you want to know about, I'm going to go through the highlights. Some of them are going to be new. Some of them are going to be old, but I think they're things that we need to be familiar with. I would not do that to you, and it would take hours. So here we go about the highlights of old and new, and I'm going to hit something called prescribing cascade before we get to the individual drugs. First, though, I'm going to also encourage you, again, to check out the American Geriatric Society website and the tools that are there or the article actually containing the beer's criteria. Remember, this list is not an evil drug list. I attended a presentation by a pharmacist once who called this the evil drug list. It's not an evil drug list. Some of these drugs need to be considered and used with caution, but potentially inappropriate is the word. There's clinical judgment. You know, doctors go to a lot of schooling, nurse practitioners, physician's assistants. They're out there to help people. They aren't out just arbitrarily prescribing evil, evil drugs, but we all need to consider as part of the team, what can we do to help? An absolute contraindication for use or meant to be a punitive tool. They are not that. You shouldn't say, this doctor prescribed that, he's a bad doctor. That's not how it goes. And they're not absolute contraindications for use. If they were, the FDA would put warnings on them and stop them from being used that way. And again, they are not a substitute for individual clinical judgment. Everybody's different, especially as they age. I always say that a 65-year-old is not the same as the 65-year-old right next to them. But if you had a 4-year-old and another 4-year-old, they'd probably be very similar with pharmacology and what we could give them. 65-year-olds, not so much. 70-year-olds, not so much. 85-year-olds, absolutely not. Everybody is individual and deserves individual clinical treatment. Again, it's not a rule or a list of do not do, but it's something always to consider closely. Always, always think of medications as a cause of a change in condition, even if the, it's not new. Because what you have to think is these people are declining, so their condition could be going down like this. Well, the drug is still staying like this, so it's still having its levels, but maybe the kidney function of the person is going down. Now we're at risk for more side effects. So even if the med's not new, always think of medications as a cause. These people are variable. Sometimes they're declining, then they're going back up. They get sick easily. Sometimes we think that we've considered things closely before we've asked for new meds, or we think that, oh, they were on this med, so it's okay to ask for it again, but we really, really need to consider before family members, before caregivers, before nurses, ask for new meds, and before prescribers prescribe new meds that might be on this list. Let's go through a prescribing cascade so you know what I'm talking about. Because otherwise, to me, it just seems like, oh, this is a huge list. We have to go through. What does that have to do with me? I don't see how it fits into things. Lexapro. Let's say you've got someone who is depressed. And the prescriber decides to put them on Lexapro. Lexapro is a good drug. It's a nice alternative for those people who happen to be on Celexa and were at over the max dose, by the way. So let's say we put someone on Lexapro. Then, maybe a week or two later, they're experiencing some insomnia. Nurse calls, caregiver calls, takes them into the doctor, whatever. We prescribe them Ambien to help them sleep. A few weeks later, we notice, you know, this person's really getting incontinent. They're unable to get to the bathroom in time. They seem to be a little groggy from the Ambien, and that's leading to some incontinence. So we give them Enablex, which is something to help people who have incontinence, and it's actually one of the newer drugs, and it's one of the newer drugs on the beers list. Then maybe a week or so later after that, we notice, oh, they seem to be having problems with sort of sleep-wake. They, they, they're seeing things. They're getting a little delirious. We're not sure if they're just agitated or they actually have delirium. They're psychotic a little bit. So we give them an antipsychotic called Seroquel. Well, then 
we notice they're sort of self-isolating. They're not going to bingo anymore. They're not doing things they used to do. They're not watching the shows they used to. You know what? They might be depressed. Let's increase that dose of Lexapro. And the cycle goes on and on and on. And it all started with us giving one drug to help them maybe with some depression. We all know a lot of things happen when people get older that can cause depression. And then we gave a drug to treat that side effect. So you give Lexapro, and a lot of people can cause insomnia. So then, what? You give them Ambien. Well, what, what are you doing now? You're treating that insomnia side effect with another drug. Well, that Ambien is causing them to be sluggish. They can't make it to coordinate. Maybe they're unbalanced to get to the bathroom. We've caused a functional incontinence through the use of a drug, which, by the way, is not treated very well with drugs. But people forget that, so they prescribe drugs for incontinence because you, you want to have a toileting program, and sometimes people think drugs should be a part of that. Well, then the Enablex has these qualities called anticholinergic effects, which help keep that urine in, sure, but people actually end up still a little bit wet anyway. They don't work all that great. But it also causes that Benadryl effect. Have you ever had a Benadryl hangover? It causes stuff like that, that dry, dumb, sleepy feeling, that confused feeling. And people who are older are very sensitive to that. And so they may have delirium. Well, then we're treating delirium with an antipsychotic, which in the elderly can increase their risk for death. All of this because of side effects from one drug we added and drugs we added subsequent to that. So the Beers criteria can really help us break stuff down and get through this. I'm going to go through the highlights now of the ones I think are more important. If you happen to know other medications that you'd like to discuss or things that you have questions about, please feel free to write in and talk to us about that. Ooh. Mm -hmm.